Understanding the concept of homeostasis sets the basis for understanding our physiological systems. Successful homeostasis is critical to an organism's survival, while failure to maintain this balance can result in disease and ultimately, death. Everything inside the human body starts from the stem cells. They later form the tissues that develop into organs. The organs come together to form organ systems that work in coordination under favorable conditions to ensure the proper functioning of the body's cells. Homeostasis is the process of how the body adapts to maintain the favorable conditions of the internal environment, using various mechanisms in order for cells to survive the constant external and internal changes. This means we have the ability to keep the internal environment of our body stable, even when the external condition is changing significantly. For example, the normal human body temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius, or 98.66 degrees Fahrenheit. But whether you step outside under the summer heat, or enter a fully air-conditioned room, your body temperature will remain stable at around 37 degrees Celsius, thanks to homeostasis. We need the temperature adjusted around that value so the proteins inside our body can retain their shapes. Otherwise, it denatures and cannot function. Besides temperature, the body also needs some other conditions to remain at set values. The acidity around the cells, measured by the power of hydrogen or pH, has to be around 7.4. Values that are higher or lower may alter the chemical reactions inside the cells. To optimally carry out its function, the blood circulatory system needs to have a sufficient amount of blood pressure of around 120 mm of mercury of systolic and 80 mm of mercury of diastolic. Diverging too much from that number can cause either hypertension, which damages the arterial wall and increases the risk of heart attacks, or hypotension, which results in less supply of blood, oxygen and nutrition to the cells. A blood glucose level between 70 and 100 mg per deciliter is necessary for normal functions. Exceeding that may indicate diabetes is developing inside our body. The amount of water and the concentration of various ions in the blood need to be on a certain amount as well to let the transport of nutrients and waste occur properly. These are just a few out of hundreds of variables to maintain, which values actually have fluctuating normal ranges but still allow an organism to thrive. To fulfill the requirements, homeostasis is facilitated by the fluids inside the body, mostly comprised of water. The circulatory system flows the blood to other organ systems aided by the fluids to obtain necessary nutrients and remove waste and byproducts. One of the most important forms of fluids is the blood plasma that can seep through the capillary wall to deliver nutrients. After the cells exchange substances with the surroundings, the fluid drains into the lymphatic vessel and re-enters the circulatory system. Some examples of how the organ systems maintain the body condition are Number 1. The respiratory system helps maintain carbon dioxide levels via breathing. Carbon dioxide is essential to maintain the blood pH through the formation of bicarbonate ions, but the excess level can be toxic. The respiratory system also supplies the necessary oxygen for cells to function. And number 2. The pancreas produces insulin and glucagon hormones to maintain the glucose level in the blood when it's becoming too high or low. Number 3. The liver aids in maintaining the body condition by converting excess glucose into glycogen for energy storage and neutralizing potential toxins to prevent cell damage. Number 4. The kidneys regulate our fluid balance by adjusting urine production to prevent dehydration and keep a normal blood pressure level. Additionally, it eliminates most of the metabolic waste to prevent it from accumulating in the body. Number 5. The skin releases sweat that evaporates to absorb heat from the body, thereby regulating our temperature while also removing excessive salts. Now, continuing our previous example, if our body fails to maintain a normal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius under the heat of the sun, then we could experience heat stroke and our body would lose consciousness. The doctors consider this state, when homeostasis is disrupted, as a state of disease. The mechanism through which homeostasis works and responds to various changes will be discussed in the next video, the negative and positive feedback systems. From the previous videos, you should have grasped a bit about homeostasis, which is how our body maintains the stability of the internal environment in spite of changes from the outside or inside of our body. For example, when we drink an absurd amount of water after a long and stressful marathon, the amount of water inside our body remains aligned with the osmotic concentration in the blood. Now, how does the body accomplish that? 
First, to be able to respond to a change or stimulus, the stimulus itself needs to be detected by utilizing various receptors inside the body. Once a stimulus is detected, the receptors send signals requesting the coordination center or the nervous system to process the information and orders the diverse effectors throughout the body to return the body to its optimal environment. These steps are called the feedback loops. To understand better about the homeostasis mechanism, let's take a look at the regulation of blood glucose level. The stimulus or disruption to the internal condition can come from the external environment, such as when a person consumes foods or drinks that are plentiful in sugar. After digestion by the digestive system, by which the sugar molecules are broken down into glucose, they start to flood the blood. The heightened blood glucose level alerts the alpha and beta cells in the pancreas, along with the glucose-sensitive neurons in the various parts of the brain, liver, and other tissues, which act as the glucose receptors or sensors. They send signals to the brain, specifically the hypothalamus area. As the blood glucose becomes too high, the brain sends a message to beta cells of the pancreas as the effector to secrete insulin hormones that act on bodily cells so they can take in more glucose. Insulin also signals the liver and skeletal muscles to increase their intake of glucose and store it as glycogen, ready to be used later. If the glucose storage is full, which is 15 grams per kilogram of body mass, the body will store the glucose as fat instead. These actions prevent the blood glucose from staying high for too long, which could lead to serious complications. How about the homeostasis mechanism due to internal stimulus? It's when the opposite change occurs. The blood runs out of glucose supply, here, the same receptors detect the blood glucose level and pass the information to the brain, which then signals the pancreas, in this time the alpha cells as the effector, to secrete the glucagon hormone. The hormones will flow along the blood and act on the liver and skeletal muscles to convert the glycogen back into glucose, raising the blood glucose level to normal. If the glycogen, the glucose storage, depletes as well, then the fat tissue will be used as an energy source. This stimulus happens when a person is doing strenuous physical activities long after his or her last mealtime. The blood glucose level is an example of the negative feedback loop of the control systems, where the body responds to change by restoring the original condition, similar to when we train with the punching bag. Another good example is the body temperature regulation. Whether it's the inside heat from an exercise or from a cold storm outside, the thermoreceptors in the skin detect all the temperature changes in the body, when the core temperature shifts beyond the accepted threshold, the negative feedback system will work to return it to normal range by utilizing the blood vessel, sweat gland, and others, so we don't easily get hypothermia in the cold or heat stroke under intense sunlight. We've covered the mechanisms of the body temperature regulation in our other channel. Please watch it. The negative feedback loop is how most of the control systems in our body operate. But do you know that the negative feedback loop can be halted so our body stays in a heated condition? During bacterial infections, the immune cells send signals to the hypothalamus to increase our core body temperature to a certain point. Higher temperature generally helps our immune system to fight the infection by messing up the bacterial metabolism, unless it's an emergency situation. It'll subside once the bacteria has been defeated. In the next video, we will discuss the positive feedback loop. While the negative feedback loop works by returning the body into the initial state from the change, the positive feedback loop works by amplifying the change. The body survivability partly depends on the homeostasis mechanism. Through the negative feedback loop, our body can maintain the stability of its internal condition despite major changes in the environment. But what if instead of counteracting those changes, the body amplifies it? That is how the positive feedback loop works. Change or stimulus detected by the receptors scattered around the human body are processed and sent as signals to order the effectors to amplify the impact of the stimulus. The loop has both beneficial and less beneficial effects on the body. The example of the beneficial effects are nerve signaling, blood clotting, and giving birth. Let's discuss the less beneficial first. Alzheimer's is one of the harshest conditions for the elderly. It decreases their quality of life by inducing loss of memory, impaired thinking, and speech difficulties. In the healthy human brain, the amyloid beta is a protein that has a role related to memory. However, in the brain of a person with Alzheimer's, the blood circulation is damaged, so the amyloid beta molecules are abnormally accumulated. These proteins tangle and fold and gradually build up into plaques. The plaques produce inflammatory molecules that damage the brain and cause other debilitating effects, including the production of more amyloid beta itself. 
Then, the newly produced molecules contribute to the formation of even more plaques and so on, so the positive feedback loop continues. To break the loop, scientists have been developing drugs that seek to reduce the amyloid beta and its precursors. However, the positive feedback loop also occurs in normal physiological processes. For example, the generation of nerve signals. When the nerve fiber is stimulated, some sodium ions will enter the nerve cells by going through the sodium gate on the nerve cell membrane. Instead of opposing this and stopping the entry of further sodium ions, the nerve cells react by opening more channels so that even more sodium ions can enter the cell. The more sodium ions entering the cell, the more the change in membrane potential, which eventually builds up the required action potential for the nerve to fire and pass the nerve signal. However, unlike in disease conditions, this positive feedback loop will eventually stop as the sodium channel deactivates itself after a certain height of membrane potential is reached. The potassium gates open and move potassium ions out of the nerve cells, so the pile of positive ions inside the cells are reduced. Furthermore, the ATP-powered sodium-potassium pumps start to pump the ions to return the nerve cells into their resting potential. The sodium channels then unblock themselves and ready for the next nerve signal. The next example of beneficial positive feedback loop is during a blood clot. If blood vessels tear open, the body needs to act fast before the blood drains out and suffocates surrounding cells. The injured blood vessels expose substances that will invite platelets to move in. The platelets are activated and bind to each other to cover the open wound, while producing signaling molecules at the same time. The increased number of molecules recruit even more platelets that now produce a vast amount of signaling molecules. The loop continues until the wound is closed and sealed by the fibrin molecules. Watch the more detailed explanation in our sister channel. Later on, some of the signaling molecules also induce the release of molecules that break down the clot, so it doesn't become detrimental to the blood flow. Another important example of positive feedback is its role in the process of childbirth. When a baby is ready to be delivered, there is an increased pressure on the cervix. This pressure signals the brain to release the oxytocin hormone to promote contraction, which leads to more pressure, more hormone release, and more contractions until the baby is delivered safely. If the positive feedback response does not come into action, there will not be enough contraction to push the baby out. When the baby is delivered and no more pressure is detected in the cervix, the positive feedback loop stops. We can see that both negative and positive feedback play very important roles in homeostasis and the survival of humans, as long as they act in balance, as all things should be. Thank you for your continuous support, especially our valued patrons and members who have been encouraging us to keep producing more quality content.